to get started. Um, first of all, let me uh, let me welcome everyone um, to this evening's this evening's events. Um, I'm Dan Blanton, uh, currently the director of the uh, program in critical theory at uh, at Berkeley, um, <clears throat> and uh, and pleased uh, pleased to have have joining us tonight uh, from all directions and all time zones. I think um, a sort of a sort of broader uh, broader participation than uh, than often often we can manage when constricted to uh, to real physical presence. As many of you uh, may recall, um, tonight's events and this week's events uh, were originally um, planned and scheduled for about this time last year, uh, when events um, forced a sudden reconsideration, a deferral, and postponement. Um, of our initial plan to welcome Professor Peter Gordon uh, to, um, <clears throat> to address uh, Adorno and uh, negative dialectics and uh, some of the work uh, that he has been compiling, um, which leaves us in the odd situation of a kind of non-identitarian event, I suppose, uh, that we, uh, we assemble now virtually a year later uh, to take up the, uh, the still pertinent um, subject. Let me just uh, mention a couple of things um, before handing uh, handing over to uh, Martin Jay uh, to introduce uh, Professor Gordon. Um, as most of you will have seen or know, uh, this is the first uh, of a couple of events um, this evening on uh, a precarious happiness, uh, Adorno and negativity, and on negativity and normativity. Um, and after this evening's uh, talk by Professor Gordon, uh, Martin Jay will have some responses and then we will, we will throw open for a larger discussion to the degree we can, um, since we are constrained by the technology and, uh, and the number of little boxes uh, that we all have, uh, have before us. Um, we'll ask anyone who has a question to, um, to enter it in the chat function. And we'll try to relay that in something like uh, a manageable, a manageable fashion. Um, if, in fact, we don't get to, and I suspect we won't, uh, cover everything needing to be said or addressed uh, this evening, um, we will convene again tomorrow uh, at the same time for a more open seminar discussion um, based on the talk tonight, uh, but also on the reading of the final, the final chapter or portion of negative dialectics. Uh, Adorno's Meditations on Metaphysics, um, which I think uh, should be available uh, in one of the uh, English versions of the links um, provided with the talk. Um, there will be joined by Peter Gordon, obviously, and by Martin Jay, also by uh, Pardis Nabashi uh, from English at the University of Nevada and Robert Kaufman um, from Comparative Literature here at Berkeley uh, in dialogue and conversation uh, regarding, regarding all of this. Um, on behalf of the program, uh, for those who are joining uh, more locally, especially perhaps, um, or, or from within uh, the Berkeley uh, orbit, let me mention a couple of other things. Um, we are, of course, in the moment of uh, graduate, graduate uh, consideration and recruiting, and I think we are being joined uh, tonight uh, by a number, of, uh, a number of people interested from the outside uh, in the Berkeley program in critical theory. For those for those um, potential doctoral students, uh, prospective doctoral students who are who are looking to um, looking to learn more about the program in particular uh, in its in its uh, curricular uh, guise, um, I will mention that on Wednesday, the seventeenth, so two days on, uh, at two thirty Pacific time um, in the afternoon, uh, we will have an open information uh, session on the program, um, geared especially for those who are. Who are considering or looking at uh, looking at the university or one of uh, one of the many doctoral programs um, contributing uh, to our own uh, designated emphasis. And for those already at Berkeley, uh, another programmatic reminder that on Thursday, uh, those currently enrolled doctoral students who are looking to join uh, join the designated emphasis, um, our application deadline for the next uh, the next admission cycle. Uh, will come on Thursday of this week. Uh, so even in a rather odd um, and, uh, and extended moment, uh, we for once have a very full week of, uh, of things to remember. Um, so with all of that sort of information uh, cleared, 
Uh, let me let me step back and invite Martin Jay, who I presume uh, needs needs no introduction himself, uh, to introduce uh, Peter Gordon, uh, who probably similarly requires none, um, but formally uh, formally uh, should receive it. Uh, Marty, if I can find you on the screen. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it's an enormous pleasure for me to introduce once again. Uh, Peter Gordon to Berkeley. Peter is no stranger to these precincts, having done his doctoral dissertation uh, at Berkeley uh, in 1997, and then uh, going for a couple of years to Princeton, where he was a member of the Society of Fellows before taking up his current position at Harvard, where he has now reached the exalted uh, status of uh, Amabel James, uh, Professor of History, and uh, also, and this is, I think, significant, uh, is a, a, has a kind of joint appointment in the German department and in philosophy. Uh, what this tells us uh, is that Peter, as an intellectual historian, has been able in a way to earn the uh, trust, the confidence of uh, people in different fields of academics uh, in philosophy and in literature, uh, showing the range in a way of his work and also the way in which intellectual history can serve as a kind of fulcrum uh, in a larger humanistic uh, context. Uh, Peter's own work has been uh, extraordinary. Uh, in the years since he left us, uh, now some 23 years, maybe 24 ago, uh, he published a dissertation uh, as uh, Rosenzweig and Heidegger, a book which won uh, quite a number of prizes uh, in Jewish history and intellectual history, it became really a standard text uh, in uh, the intellectual history of 20th century German Jewry. This was followed by another book which dealt with Heidegger, but now uh, in conversation or in dialogue or in polemic really uh, with Ernst Kassir, a book called uh, Continental Divide, uh, which became also a kind of standard text uh, for anyone who wanted to understand uh, the way in which phenomenology challenged uh, neo-Kantian philosophy in the 20th century. And then he had what I would call a kind of conversion experience away from uh, Heidegger to some extent even away from Rosenzweig and towards the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory and Adorno in particular. Uh, a very curious trajectory and he'd been my graduate student and had shown at least no early signs of being infected by the Frankfurt School bug but later somehow uh, it seems to have had a delayed impact. And this produced initially a, a wonderful book called Adorno and Experience, which deals with the uh, importance uh, of existentialism, Kierkegaard in particular, in Adorno's formation. And then most recently, a book uh, which came out uh, just last year, I'll hold it up for you to read it, uh, called uh, Migrants in the Profane Critical Theory and the Question of Secularization. And this book has, uh, among other things, a blurb on the back no less a figure than uh, Jürgen Habermas, uh, who says it brilliantly succeeds in disentangling the different interpretations uh, of this explosive idea of secularization, the works of Benjamin, uh, Horkheimer, and Adorno. And I should add, and this is a kind of footnote to, to the introduction, and I'll stop uh, here. Uh, this is a kind of payback, uh, that is to say, Habermas's blurb. Marty, you muted yourself. Uh, I'm not sure how back I should, how far back I should go. Uh, I was saying simply that this, this book, <clears throat> the blurb in the back, is a kind of payback for Habermas's, uh, uh, well, for Peter's help when Habermas was preparing uh, his two volume uh, book, How Can a Geschichte der Philosophie, or Philosophie der Geschichte, I forget the exact. Uh, sequence, a two volume book uh, on the issue of uh, secularization and religion. Peter actually read uh, the manuscript for Habermas. Habermas was anxious to get some uh, sort of serious response before the book was published. And uh, Peter gave uh, Habermas the green light, and the book uh, was, uh, in fact, uh, finally released. And uh, as um, a modest recompense, uh, we have this wonderful blurb in the back of Peter's own new book. Well, having finished with that, let me then simply turn the floor over to Peter uh, 
uh, uh, who will tell us about uh, Adorno on negativity and normativity in the talk entitled A Precarious Happiness. So please, a virtual uh, round of applause for Peter uh, Gordon as he comes back to Berkeley virtually, but still uh, in spirit right here. Thanks. myself. There, I'm unmuted. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, very good. Well, thank you very, very much, Marty, for that exceptionally kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for the deafening applause. Um, it's it's always delightful to, uh, to speak to a, a Berkeley audience, though, uh, perhaps with some, some chagrin to find myself speaking uh, over Zoom. So, I'm with you in spirit and in pixel, if not in body. And um, I, I should maybe just explain that this talk is a um, <clears throat> is a small exercise running through some of the themes that I'm working out in a longer manuscript, which is due to Zurkamp Verlag uh, next December, based on the Adorno Vorlesungen that I gave on the 50th anniversary of Adorno's death uh, in 2019. Uh, so uh, I, I, my email is available to you and I'll, I'll post it at the end of the talk. And, and if you do have any uh, suggestions, uh, criticisms, um, uh, even rants, uh, I'll, I'll welcome them because they can only uh, help me to improve the manuscript. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There we go. This quotation from uh, the spring of 1969, shortly before Adorno's death, is uh, one that what you might say inspires the entire talk. The happiness that dawns in the eye of the thinking person is the happiness of, of humanity. And, uh, and let me say that the entirety of the talk that follows could be seen as a kind of commentary on this uh, on this claim and the theme of happiness in Adorno's work. Let me begin by recalling the plot of Fidelio, Beethoven's first and only successful venture into the operatic form. Composed in 1805, Fidelio is a document of hopeful classicism, unspooling the tale of Leonora, a devoted wife who rescues her husband Florestan from a Spanish prison. In act two, we encounter Florestan in his prison cell and he sings a lament. Gott verstunkel here, how dark it is. But then he consoles himself with the image of his wife, Leonora, about whom he sings, Ein Engel, Leonoren der Garten so gleich, der führt mich zur Freiheit ins himmlische Reich. An angel, Leonora, so like my wife, who will le who lead me to freedom in the heavenly kingdom. Now, as musicologists have observed, the theme of redemption that animates the opera may express the composer's own longing, both for personal love and also for release from the isolation of his own deafness, whose afflictions brought him to the edge of suicide just a few years before, as we know from the Heiligenstadt Testament. In Beethoven's libretto, however, the longing for redemption is not only personal. Act one concludes with the well-known scene in which the band of prisoners uh, is permitted a momentary respite in the sunlight where they sing, O Verse Lust, O oh, what a joy. And they're then conducted back into the darkness and must bid the sunshine farewell. Leb wohl, du warmest Sonnenlicht. Now in 1955, Adorno wrote an essay on bourgeois opera in which he offers some comments on Fidelio as a specimen of the Enlightenment and its emancipatory ideals. In the late modern era, Adorno explains, when the Enlightenment may seem to have betrayed its true promise and the disenchanted world seems to have been reduced to an iron cage, there's a great risk that we will come to think of freedom as a world transcendent or metaphysical ideal that stands absolutely opposed to present darkness. On this interpretation, our world is a closed prison and freedom appears as its total negation. Freedom has grown so improbable that we think of it as a wholly transcendent norm, an ought that starkly contradicts the is. 
But Adorno warns us against this interpretation. The dream of our liberation becomes little more than ideology when it's conceived as an abstract principle that stands opposed to history. For this reason, Adorno tells us, we should not feel appeased by the opera's finale when trumpets announce the arrival of the minister Don Fernando. This denouement, Adorno says, offers little more than an authoritarian solution. It doesn't realize our hope for freedom, but violates it. Metaphysics today, Adorno explains, must have an altogether different meaning. If the ideal of freedom still holds any validity, its values, writes Adorno, must embed themselves in history. Our imprisonment in a blind and unselfconscious system cannot be dissociated from the idea of freedom that arises in its midst. Metaphysics, he concludes, is not an unchanging realm to be grasped by looking out through the barred windows of the historical. It is the glimmer, albeit a powerless glimmer, of light which falls into the prison itself. So I wanted to begin this talk by recalling Adorno's comments from 1955, not because I want to speak about his aesthetic theory, but only because his observations concerning our modern idea of freedom may help us to untie a difficult knot in his philosophy. What Adorno says about the light that we glimpse in the prison itself poses an interesting challenge to a now standard reading of his work. On this reading, Adorno is a theorist of thorough, thoroughgoing negativity, by which I mean that he sees the entirety of our social world as plunged into darkness, such that we cannot claim any imminent sources of moral guidance. Now, of course, many passages in Adorno's work would seem to support such a reading. In negative dialectics, we're told that every image of humanity other than a negative one is ideology. And in Minima Moralia, we read that there is not a crevice in the cliff of the established order into which the ironist might hook a fingernail. Now, such aphorisms are bracing in their Nietzschean force, and they may seem to provide decisive evidence for the interpretation of Adorno as a totalizing skeptic about moral knowledge and moral conduct. That view finds its most famous confirmation in the aphorism from Minima Moralia, Es gibt kein richtiges Leben im Falschen. There's no right life in the false. This single phrase has become such a commonplace in the literature on Adorno that it's hardened into a cliche, and it should come as no surprise that it even appears on the bas-relief plaque on the apartment building in Frankfurt's West End, where Adorno spent the final years of his life. In an ironic twist of fate, the culture industry has taken its last revenge against the theorist who helped to diagnose its ills, and it has reproduced Adorno's image on fetishized tchotchkes on coffee cups and t-shirts where he appears as a scowling contrarian who gives the entire world his thumbs down. Still, it's an image that has received much support in the scholarly literature. Among the very strongest and most successful readings of Adorno as a totalizing skeptic is the 2013 book by Fabian Freienhagen, Adorno's Practical Philosophy, in which we're presented with an argument for reading Adorno as what uh, Freienhagen calls an epistemic negativist. Now, I want to emphasize this is a book that I think anyone interested in Adorno or the Frankfurt School should read. I think it's superb, and I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't uh, direct my challenges toward Fabian's book if I didn't actually find it such an, a, 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 a powerful and in many respects uh, uh, convincing uh, uh, argument. According to Freienhagen, ep an epistemic negativist denies that we have any knowledge of the good. Like Hegel, Adorno believes that what is normative for any culture must gain some kind of historical actuality if we're to know its character. According to Freienhagen, however, Adorno sees the entirety of our social order as bad without qualification, and this means that Adorno must deny that we possess any positive grasp of the good. In my view, Freienhagen's argument stands as one of the most ambitious and fruitful efforts to answer the question of normativity in Adorno's thought. It goes a long way toward helping us to grasp the meaning in Adorno's enigmatic dictum that there is no right life in the false. 
If we're plunged completely and without qualification into a false society, then it would seem to follow that we have no norms available to us that could serve as resources for our critical practice and for resistance. This is indeed a familiar puzzle. Among the most contested questions in the history of critical theory is whether it can hold fast to its critique of social rationalization without lapsing into performative contradiction. In the Philosophical Discourse of Modernity, for example, Jürgen Habermas claimed that the authors of Dialectic of Enlightenment left themselves vulnerable to this verdict because their critique of instrumental reason metastasized into a totalizing critique of reason as such and they did not leave themselves the normative resources they required to justify their own critical efforts. Freienhagen wants to rescue Adorno from this impasse by appealing to a potential of basic human functioning that remains unrealized in our false society, but nonetheless permits us to identify what is false. Adorno, on Freinagen's view, might therefore be understood as advocating a kind of negative Aristotelianism. This is, this is Freinagen's claim. Adorno sees that there is a damaged and unfulfilled potential in the human being that serves as a practical postulate. Humanity lives in a destitute condition. We exhibit what Freinagen calls a widespread shortfall from basic functioning. But this sense of shortfall still implies an unrealized potential. Now, the potential, Freinagen says, has the status of an Aristotelian ergon, except for the important qualification that it's not yet available to us as a robust concept. We cannot know anything positive about this potential, he says. The current social world is so deeply delusional that we cannot even conceptualize or imagine what realized humanity would consist in. This is why Freinagen tells us that our normative orientation itself can only be negative. It is directed against the bad rather than towards the good. And the best Adorno can counsel, Freinagen concludes, is an ethics of living less wrongly, hence the subtitle of his book. Now, in this paper, I want to advance some thoughts as to why we should reject the view of Adorno as an epistemic negativist. I should begin, however, by granting that there's indeed a fair bit of evidence that would seem to favor the negativist interpretation. Much, though not all of it, appears in the form of darkly hyperbolic aphorisms and obiter dicta that have earned Adorno a reputation for relentless negativity as if he were the reincarnation of Goethe's Mephistopheles. Ich bin der Geist, der stets verneint und das mit Recht, denn alles, was entsteht, ist wert, dass es zugrunde geht. I am the spirit that ever negates and rightly so for all that comes to be, all that comes to be deserves to go under, to be abolished. Now, this comparison to Mephistopheles is revealing, not least because Mann's novel, Dr. Faustus, in Mann's no novel, Dr. Faustus, the devil transforms momentarily into an apparition who bears some resemblance to Adorno himself. Mephistopheles, Mann writes, has horn-rimmed spectacles on his hooked nose and his brow is pale and vaulted. He's a member of the intelligentsia, Mann continues, a writer on art, a theoretician and critic who composes as far as thinking allows him. It was the literary critic Hans Meyer who first noted this resemblance, prompting Adorno to ask Mann if the resemblance were intentional, though Mann insisted that the true model for this apparition was not Adorno, but Gustav Mahler. And indeed something in the physiognomy does suggest Mahler rather than Adorno, though the description of the life activities, uh, the vocation uh, certainly sounds like Adorno. Uh, despite Mann's denial, Adorno was not inhibited from taking some delight in this dark homage, and following its discovery, he once signed a letter to a friend, the devil. Now, whatever the truth behind this tale, the comparison to Mephistopheles is philosophically instructive, as it helps us to see that when we cast Adorno as an epistemic negativist, we're indulging in a crypto-theological dualism, where we say that because the world is not wholly redeemed, it must be wholly damned. Alles, was entsteht, ist wert, dass es zugrunde geht. 
Whatever one makes of this comparison, the, the fact remains that the negativist interpretation has a long history. And it's surely responsible for the popular perception of Adorno and his colleagues as theorists of radical pessimism who took up a permanent residence in the Grand Hotel Abyss and could offer no positive counsel as to how the world might be improved. The thesis figures as the central claim in Michael Toynesen's well-known essay, Negativität by Adorno from 1983, and it's received confirmation in various other places, including Michael Powen's 1994 book, uh, Dithyrams of Decline, in which Adorno appears alongside philosophers such as Heidegger and Klages as exponents of what Powen calls a late modern reprisal of Gnosticism. So my argument here is that this Gnostic or negativistic interpretation is misleading. Adorno does not paint the world in such extravagant blackness as to inhibit our present glimpse of alternative ways of being human. It's surely right that Adorno sees our current world as damaged, but damage is not destruction. Not damage is not thoroughgoing destruction. And we should avoid the error of turning negativism into a totalizing ideology that it's a faced all light. My own argument follows after readers such as Rachel Yegi in ascribing to Adorno a practice of imminent critique. This involves his appeal to fleeting moments of material happiness that we can detect even in the midst of our social happiness. Such moments anticipate a general happiness that the world now denies. But those moments also furnish a surplus of normativity that spills over the current negativity of our world. And it's only by appealing to that surplus that we can judge current conditions deficient. Or well, that'll be my argument. Now, to develop that argument in greater precision, and before turning to my alternative proposal, let me briefly note three further disadvantages of the negativism interpretation. And I'll call these the uniformity thesis, the problem of conceptual adequacy, or the problem of concepts and closure, and the uh, failure of self-reflexivity. The first disadvantage is that the uh, theory of <coughs> a total negativity presupposes what we might call uniformity. This is a view of society as a seamless whole without breaks or contradictions. But this thesis is easily dispatched. We know that Adorno tended to resist all claims to social uniformity. He states this point directly at the conclusion to Minimum Moralia, where he famously writes that the task of criticism is to reveal the world with all of its risse und schrinde, its rifts and crevices. Now, if he believes it's possible, in some way to expose such lines of fracture, that should suffice to reject the uniformity thesis as contravening his own understanding of social reality. <clears throat> the second and closely related disadvantage is that the uniformity thesis also conflicts with Adorno's basic views on the relation between concepts and objects. It was Adorno's view that concepts always display a kind of insufficiency in relation to objects. They cannot wholly subsume the objects to which they refer. Adorno stated this point early in his career, in his 1931 inaugural address, The Actuality of Philosophy, where he wrote that today we must reject the view that the power of thought is sufficient to grasp the totality of the real. I take this uh, must also apply a fortiori to any attempt to secure a conceptual grasp of society as a whole. Now, this is a formal point about social knowledge. It applies to all claims to total comprehension, whether such claims are affirmative or negative. Adorno associates such claims with the subject's ambition to dominate the object by asserting a final identity between subject and object, between concept and object. Such an identity yields an image of the world as one of perfect closure. In Dialectic of Enlightenment, we read that it is the chief work of ideology to present existence as unbroken and closed, or as a geschlossene Dasein, a, a closed existence. But that image of closure, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer go on, is never the truth about social reality. It's only an ideological portrait that they don't hesitate to call a lie. 
Seen in this light, we can better understand why Adorno doesn't wish to advance anything like a deontological ethics or a formal set of moral principles. He's suspicious of deontological reasoning because he believes that the strategy of universal universalization uh, that it implies looks like another attempt by the subject to impose its conceptual schemes on a heterogeneous field of objects or cases whose differences are thereby obscured. Kantian moral reasoning would therefore be another instance of uniformity. It would imply domination by a subject that arrogates to itself the power of the universal over the particular. This suspicion of universalization then moves Adorno to declare in his lectures on moral philosophy that there is no ethics in the administered world. His allergy to the absolutism of moral discourse is so pronounced that he often seems willing to lapse into hyperbolic statements of total negativity. So for instance, he uh, says the following, we may not know what absolute good is or the absolute norm, we may not even know what man is or the human or humanity, but what the inhuman is, we know very well indeed. I'll end there. Now, at first glance, this may look very much like an endorsement of epistemic negativism. We do not know the good, <clears throat> we know only the bad. But this is to miss an essential feature in moral discourse, the particular feature that Adorno finds objectionable. His chief complaint here is directed against claims to knowledge of the absolutely good or the absolute norm. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in his lectures on moral philosophy, he tends to conflate all moral discourse with absolutist discourse, which helps to explain why he rushes to the opposite extreme of thoroughgoing moral skepticism. But we can't take such skepticism at face value since elsewhere in his work, Adorno argues with great passion against it. If we truly believed that the social whole permitted no possible glimpse of the good, our criticism could secure no leverage against what's, what exists. The absolute image of a false society after all is no less totalizing than the absolute image of an affirmative society that's promoted by the culture industry. Any image of perfect closure would spell the end to all criticism and land us in despair. And in the final pages to negative dialectics, Adorno offers what I take to be a decisive argument against the image of perfect closure. The course of the world, he writes, is not completely closed and also not absolute despair. Now the above passage, this passage here on your screen, pushes against the thesis of ep epistemic negativism. Closure or Geschlossenheit is not the conclusive truth about the world, though in our current despair, we may very well feel ourselves tempted to draw such a conclusion. The implication here is that in our metaphysical thinking, we should not capitulate to actuality. Concepts are not adequate to objects, and it follows that we cannot permit ourselves to make totalizing claims about society as a whole. This rejection of totalizing claims also carries moral implications, since the notion of closure is designed to shut down our awareness of possibility and confirm our sense of hopelessness. Closure, in other words, is not the truth of the world, it is its ideology. This brings me to a third and more comprehensive reason as to why we should reject the uniformity thesis. Its chief disadvantage is that it can't respond to the challenge of self-reflexivity. By this, I mean that any social theory must offer a portrait of the social world that also explains the conditions of its own possibility. No critical social theory can be valid if it doesn't respond to that challenge. A theory that advertises itself as critical can't believe that society has closed down every glimpse of alternatives without eliminating the conditions of possibility for its own critical practice. We should note here in passing that Adorno spent much of his energy in the post-war years working in public, in lectures, and even on the radio in practical efforts to improve the political culture of the Bundesrepublik. Such practices perform or pragmatically presuppose a commitment to the possibility of social betterment. And now if Adorno truly believed that there were no crevice in the established order, 
he would indeed be vulnerable to the familiar charge of performative contradiction. And he can be defended against this charge only because he doesn't subscribe to the view of society as absolutely closed. So taken together, these three characters, considerations suggest that Adorno can't be characterized as a total negativist who sees society as uniformly wrong. The uniformity thesis runs into fatal difficulties, not least because it conflicts with our conception of Adorno as a theorist who means to practice critique. But critique is only possible if, it, if one can adopt a critical stance against society from the inside. This is the meaning of imminent critique. And Adorno, I would argue, is an advocate of imminent critique insofar as he does not absent himself from the object of his criticism. He understands himself, after all, as a member of modern society and disavows any claims to epistemic privilege or normative knowledge that would transcend it. But this means that he must have access to some species of internal or imminent normativity. When we characterize Adorno as a total negativist, we obscure those features of imminent normativity that allow for the possibility of his very own critical practice. Now, before I offer an account of those sources of imminent normativity, it might be instructive to consider how a similar problem arises in our interpretation of Marx. It's worth recalling here that especially in the Anglophone field known as analytical Marxism, scholars have spent a fair bit of time on the question as to whether Marx had any warrant for laying out his critique of capitalism with recourse to moral language. Did Marx, for example, mean to characterize capitalism as unjust? In a classic page, paper from 1972, Alan Wood argued that Marx eschews any talk of justice or injustice because Marx felt that such language is merely juridical. To speak of justice is merely to speak of the functionality of a given arrangement according to the norms of the bourgeois state. Thus Wood's argument. We can't expect a system's functional terms, such as injustice, to get any grip on what might be wrong about capitalism, since it's a term that arises from capitalist society and merely affirms its proper functioning. Wood's specific views on the concept of justice itself are less interesting here than the broader question as to whether Marx wished to articulate his critique of capitalism with recourse to concepts of moral appraisal or disapproval at all. Consider, for example, the term exploitation as expounded in Capital. Now, we might agree that exploitation is an objective term that it identifies only the extraction of surplus value as an essential feature of capitalism. But we might, of course, further ask whether Marx wished to say that exploitation violates some deeply held norms as to what is right or fair or good. One standard view is that Marx could not appeal to any such norms since he considered the language of moral appraisal itself to be both system dependent and system affirmative. On this view, Marx felt that bourgeois society exhibits a kind of holistic unity. It comprises a certain set of productive material arrangements that fit together more or less seamlessly with a certain set of social arrangements and also with a certain set of representational schemes, including culture, art, law, morality, and so forth. And we'd be wrong to imagine that any such symbolic goods could ever conflict in a meaningful way with the broader social and productive arrangements uh, beneath them. To explain that notion of holistic unity, one doesn't need to resort to deflationary notions of epiphenomenalism. One simply needs to say that the symbolic goods go together with the social structure in a certain harmonistic fashion. Such reasoning, of course, finds much support in Marx's own writing. In 1875, for instance, he wrote against the Lasallian tendencies uh, of the Gotha program that, quote, right can never be higher than the economic structure of society and its cultural development condition thereby. Now, the question of normativity is an old chestnut in Marx scholarship, and I have virtually nothing to offer here that would advance the debate except for one simple point. It seems obvious to me, at least, that it, Marx meant for us to understand that capitalism exhibits a systemic wrong, and if he was committed to this claim in any sense, he must also have believed that the system contains normative resources of some kind 
for explaining why it's wrong, since otherwise he could not have answered the challenge of self-reflexivity. It's true that in his critique of bourgeois society, Marx avoided all appeals to system transcendent moral language. Like Hegel, you could say he rejected holding up an abstract and external standard of the ought that would be imposed from the outside on the is. Instead, much like Hegel, he wished to identify the ought that is already latent within the is, the rational, you could say, that lies coiled and still unrealized as a latent moment in the actual. As early as 1843, in a letter to Arnold Rüge, Marx expressed this commitment to a Hegelian model of imminent normativity. When he wrote, the critic can therefore start out by taking any form of theoretical and practical consciousness and develop from its very own forms of existing reality, the true reality as its ought and as its final purpose. The letter to Ruga supports the view that Marx subscribed to a theory of imminent normativity, which is to say that he didn't see capitalist modernity as, a, as wholly uniform and self-consistent. Rather, he saw it as an order shot through with contradiction. Now, the presence of such contradictions has two important consequences. First, it helps to explain why capitalism is not stable or has internal contradictions and might at least be susceptible to historical transformation. And second, it also explains how it might be possible for an inhabitant of the capitalist system to gain some critical distance against the system by appealing to internal features of that order that do not support it. Normative features of our social world bear a surplus of validity that call that world into question and point to remedies that cannot be satisfied on imminent terms. Taking critical distance from society in just this fashion and mobilizing that surplus is what we mean by imminent critique. The practice of imminent critique identifies points of fracture or negativity in the current social order. But these points of fracture are negative only in the sense that they conflict with current social arrangements. And more importantly, they have an anticipatory status such that they are signs within existing reality of what Marx calls the true reality as it ought to be. Or to rephrase the same point in a more compressed way, present negativity is both normative and anticipatory. I take it this is what Marx means when he says toward the end of the same letter to Ruga that we develop new principles to the world out of its principles. Now, my argument here is that Adorno is similar to Marx in at least these respects. Mar like Marx, Adorno rejects the portrait of the capitalist order as uniform, but his point is that we should resist this ideology since otherwise we would find ourselves in the same predicament as readers of Marx who ascribe to him a totalizing picture of capitalist society and then struggle to explain how he could have found it objectionable. Fortunately, Adorno adopts a posture that resembles Marx in this relevant respect because Adorno too practices a mode of imminent critique, of determinate rather than merely abstract negation, which is to say he rejects the view of society as uniform, he identifies a normative surplus, and that normative surplus uh, uh, provides him with anticipatory standards. He mobilizes, in other words, latent or partly unrealized moments of negativity in contemporary society, and he takes these moments as higher anticipatory standards of truth against which he can measure what is false about our current life. And now, finally, what, what do those standards look like in Adorno? And this brings me to my point. They are not concepts. They are glimpses of material happiness. And this is this, now I come to the argument. But that argument immediately uh, uh, raises an objection. 
One objection to this argument would be that it mischaracterizes Adorno as some kind of utopian, where the term happiness implies some plenitude of, of feeling or bodily experience or, or individual satisfaction that is uh, uh, wholly satisfying, at least for the person uh, who finds themselves uh, in that state. It suggests that Adorno felt it might be possible to have some grasp of a perfect standard, even while living in a manifestly imperfect world. But this objection, I think, misses the subtle point of Adorno's thinking. Although he rejects the utopian view that we possess a perfect standard, he nonetheless insists on the possibility of gaining a partial and uncertain grasp of the true in the midst of the false. And this is where the thesis of epistemic negativism might mislead us, since it sets up the expectation that Adorno must claim a perfect standard of the good if he is to claim a standard of the good at all. The thesis of epistemic negativism says that Adorno permits us to know only the false, and so we're left only with the rather deflationary and dispiriting advice that we must learn to live, quote, less wrongly. The problem with this thesis, after all, is that the term false is unavoidably contrastive. The characterization of our current life as false already implies some conception of what it would be like for it to be true. And Adorno makes precisely this point in his essay, Critique, where he writes in conscious allusion to Spinoza that the false once determinately known and precisely expressed is already an index of what is right and better. He pursues this argument even to the very heart of his analysis of concepts. Consider, for instance, the following rather dense passage from Negative Dialectics. Uh, now, this is, a, this is a complicated passage, but it's one of those marvelous passages in Negative Dialectics where Adorno takes up a, 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 a very conventional problem in epistemology. Uh, how does our concept map, map onto the object? Uh, and, and then he gives it um, this interesting dialectical and eventually utopian twist. So on the one hand, he criticizes the concept's ambition to dominate the object. But on the other hand, he sees that very ambition as a distorted longing for genuine reconciliation. Here's the passage. It is hubris, he says, that identity would be. In other words, that the thing in itself would correspond to its, to its concept. So that would be hubris. But its ideal is not to be simply thrown away. In the reproach that the thing would not be identical with the concept, there lives to the longing that it would like to be so. In this form, the consciousness of non-identity contains identity. Indeed, the supposition of this all the way down to formal logic is the ideological moment in pure thinking. In it, however, the moment of truth of ideology is also hidden. The injunction that no contradiction, no antagonism ought to be. Adorno's point here is that even the false claim to an identity between concept and object bespeaks the utopian promise of a relation that would not be one of mere domination. This is the truth moment in ideology, an anticipation of freedom that we can locate within unfreedom. His argument in this passage offers an intriguing specimen of imminent critique practiced upon a conventional problem of epistemology. In one of his final public statements on German radio from February 1969, he observed that thinking itself is the force of resistance. Thinking, he said, uh, <clears throat> is resistance even though it is not secured, not by the existing conditions, nor by ends yet to be achieved. The normative commitments that animate our criticism are not so secure or certain as to constitute an incorrigible knowledge of the good. Adorno, in other words, is not a utopian. Representations of the right life in the midst of the wrong inevitably capture the right life only in partial form and never in its perfection. 
But this is not to deny that some such glimpses are somehow available to us in our current life. Indeed, Adorno insists that these representations often show up as what he calls the non-identical. And he further argues that in a false society, the non-identical often appears, though it doesn't necessarily appear, in the guise of the negative. This is his way of saying that a society that a society that is in the grips of an affirmative ideology may compel the critic to adopt what might seem to be a wholly negative negative stance, one that breaks through the crust of false affirmation. And this, you could say, is the truth in the uh, culture industry's advertising uh, uh, portrait of Adorno as the scowling contrarian. There is a truth to that because the non-identical often appears as the purely negative. But Adorno goes much further than this. And here we come at last to the alternative in Adorno's work that redeems him from the charge of epistemic negativism. He suggests that the non-identical does not always appear as the negative, Though it resists appearing in conceptual form, it can show up in the guise of fleeting experiences, and more specifically, as experiences of partial happiness. Such experiences are what he calls promises rather than fully blown images of perfection. They're mere traces of that other life, traces that are imminent to our social world, traces that point in an anticipatory fashion to experiences that would be altogether different than those that are widely available under our current conditions. As untenable as the traces of the other are in it, as much as all happiness is distorted by its revocability, the existent is nevertheless shot through in the gaps that stamp identity as a lie with the promises constantly broken of that other. Every happiness is a fragment of the total happiness which human beings are denied and which they deny themselves. Now notice in this passage that Adorno preserves just enough of the inherited language of universalization in ethics to say that each single experience of happiness shows up as a piece of a total happiness that would have to be shared across all members of society. Adorno is sufficiently a realist about the human condition that he doesn't ignore the current fact of widespread misery, but he doesn't permit that misery to nullify the reality of a happiness that is admittedly rare, nor does he indulge in inflationary claims about moments of unqualified bliss uh, that are available to a select few. He's quick to admit that such moments are exceptional, and he further notes that they too exhibit distortion since the world in which they occur is distorted as well. Now, let me pause here to note that there's admittedly something odd about the portrait of, of Adorno that I've been advancing here. It may seem too hopeful or even hedonistic as if it were fixed exclusively on matters of personal experience that have no obvious bearing on social analysis. A skeptic might object that in Adorno's thinking, the appeal to happiness is not only marginal, but a kind of philosophical embarrassment. It's one of those features that most marks Adorno as a sybaritic and pampered child of the European bourgeoisie. The skeptic will further object that Adorno at heart was a radical in his criticism, and he can only be truly radical if he pursues what Marx called in his 1943 letter to Ruga, a ruthless criticism of everything existing. Surely that's not the child represented here. <clears throat> now it's the burden of my argument that this reputation is misleading. Readers of Adorno, after all, are divided by interest. Some wish to place him in the canon of political philosophy. Others prefer to read him for his contributions to aesthetics or musicology in particular. But such distinct distinctions are effective only so long as we conform to the division of labor that governs the modern research university. And for Adorno's work, this division is of little relevance and may even betray a kind of fetishism of the academic disciplines. 
If we wish to identify the normative resources that he sees as imminent to social reality, we should resist the urge to read his work in fragments as if the social critic could be distinguished from the voluptuary. It's a characteristic of his thinking that the very same themes, after all, recur across different domains. More importantly, however, I think we need to resist the urge to locate themes of social and political theory in a precinct that can be fully isolated from themes of personal experience. A social theorist might say that she's concerned with categories of social normativity only, such as equality, justice, or legality, while it looks as if Adorno's conception of happiness is primarily personal. This distinction, however, neglects the fact that Adorno, like other partisans of first-generation critical theory, saw the social and the personal as two moments in a mediated, though non-reductive, dialectic. While it's true that individual happiness can't be sublated into the social to the point of vanishing, no conception of social normativity can retain its validity if it doesn't respond to the interior demands of the self. And this socially relevant and normative concept of happiness is especially relevant when we examine what we could call Adorno's materialism. Uh, now, I, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll skip a little bit here because I, I worry I'm, I'm um, taxing your patience too much. My question about Adorno is whether there's a non-reductive, uh, non-dogmatic meaning to materialism that would serve emancipation and wouldn't reinforce the overwhelming authority of the material given merely as it's given. And to answer that question, we should note that the materialist element in Adorno's work is considerably broader than doctrinal Marxism, though it also responds to the, material, the Marxist emphasis on social suffering. Materialism in this more capacious sense directs us toward human experience in its embodiment and its fragility. These are traits that recall the nature within human nature, the nature that underwent, according to Adorno, a partial repression with the rise of the rational subject. Even in the late phase of capitalist modernity, when the Enlightenment has subverted its own promise, Adorno argues, traces of this original and mimetic bond with nature still obtain, though they survive only at the margins of our rationalized experience. Mimesis for Adorno and for Horkheimer is a materialist relation. It serves as a name for the sensual point of contact between subject and object that over the course of history has been strained almost to a breaking point. This materialist relation is arguably what Adorno most prized in psychoanalysis, especially where Freud's candid focus on sexual experience seemed to carry some normative promise. Consider this well-known passage from Minima Moralia. He alone who could situate utopia in blind somatic pleasure has a stable and valid idea of truth. Now in this passage, three points deserve special emphasis. The first two points are relatively straightforward. First, Adorno discuss, discovers a normative or utopian moment in sensual pleasure. Truth here serves as a critical standard against which we can measure untruth, the extent of unhappiness and social suffering. But second, it's no less clear that this appeal to the utopia of bodily happiness does not betray any kind of nostalgia for prelapsarian or naturalistic communion. Adorno, after all, doesn't wish us to abandon all of the conceptual capacities that we've gained over the course of civilization. He nevertheless enjoins us to redeem, to redeem those rare traces of mimetic happiness that still persist in the world despite its disfigurement. And this brings me at last to my third and concluding point. The truth that Adorno locates in somatic pleasure does not occur with undiminished perfection as if it beckoned as a genuine utopia. The passage from Minima Moralia is somewhat misleading on this score, as it seems to imply that somatic pleasure just is already our utopia or normative standard. But if we know nothing else about Adorno, we know that this cannot be right, since he resists any appeals to perfection as, ideo as ideological, 
and as compensatory for the wider imperfection of social reality. At least in this respect, if not in others, he remains faithful to the Marxist critique of utopianism. In a damaged life, nothing can show itself that does not also bear the damage of its survival. This is true, for example, of Odysseus, who, as we learn in the excursus to dialectic of enlightenment, must disfigure himself if he is to survive. But it's no less true for each of us in our present lives. The normative standard of sensual happiness does not appear without bearing the wounds of social imperfection. Keeping this point in mind is crucial if we wish to defend Adorno against the charge of aestheticism. The charge is common enough, especially in popular misrepresentations of Adorno as a man of great privilege who turned his back on social conflict and bathed himself in the esoteric luxuries of high modernism. It's well known, of, however, that Adorno conceived of art itself as a seismograph of social imperfection. This is why his aesthetic theory must be read as an extension of his social theory and not as a retreat from it. To appreciate that final point, consider this intriguing passage from the 1957 Konigstein lecture at Darmstadt, Criteria of the New Music. <clears throat> and this is, this is really the, 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 the proof text for me. Everything I've been coming to is this. At the end of the bourgeois epoch, Spirit recalls the nemesis of prehistorical times, the reflex-like imitation, the feudal impulse from which the spirit, the thing that was different from existing reality, once arose. Overwhelmed by the power of the world of things, it took refuge in the rudimentary minimum to which the world of things had forced it to regress. This precarious happiness, however, is as fully present as despair in the new music. Now, I consider this passage dispositive, but I should explain that I'm not interested here in expounding any particular details of Adorno's musicology or his aesthetic theory more generally. I'm calling our attention to this passage only because it illustrates something more general about Adorno's conception of happiness. The argument would seem to be that we now find ourselves at the twilight phase of bourgeois civilization when human consciousness or spirit is yielding to the overall process of reification. Spirit now confronts die Übermacht der Dingwelt, the superior power of the world of things. But even at this phase, something of our original and mimetic relation with nature still survives though it now finds a hiding place in sensuous and somatic reality, even if this reality too suffers great distortion. This is the dialectical import of sensuous experience and more specifically in aesthetic experience, that it serves as a refuge for a spirit that sustains both its difference from nature and also its mimetic bond with it. Art is only the most formal or institutional manifestation of that survival. Protected from complete dissolution by the bourgeois and half fictional ideal of aesthetic autonomy, art becomes one of the last, if embattled sites in which a spiritual mimesis might still survive. This is why Adorno speaks of it as a precarious happiness. In the Kranichstein lecture, he specifically extols the new music of the second Viennese school and its followers for its ability to thematize both happiness and despair. It sustains both a memory of sensuous mimesis and interlaces that very memory with a recognition of its own debased social origins. Let's come to the conclusion. That dialectic is not confined to the second Viennese school and it is not confined to art. The broader lesson of Adorno's imminent critical method is that in a false society, no happiness can be fully happy. No utopia can be complete. Among the more moving passages in Adorno's Minima Moralia is the author's confession in Aphorism 128 
of the happiness he has always felt when in a characteristic gesture of mimesis, he imagines himself like the rabbits from a children's song who are nearly shot dead, but then realize they are still alive. The animals are stunned and half dead with fright, but they soon collect their wits and dart off as swiftly as they can. Their escape, their happiness at their escape is commingled with fear and a recognition of how close they came to death. But such is the intellectual candor that must accompany any experience of happiness that does not succumb to ideology by shutting out the recognition of current pain. For what would happiness be, Adorno concludes, were it not measured by the immeasurable grief of what is? Clearly, the answer to this question must be that our happiness itself is interlaced with precarity and cannot be conceived as an unblemished utopia that offers consolation to present despair. But this does not mean there is no happiness at all. And the fact that all happiness is precarious does not license the conclusion that we have no experience of happiness whatsoever. Stated differently, the fact that we do not know redemption in its fullness and perfection cannot serve as a warrant for descending into wholesale skepticism about the normative resources that are available to us in our everyday experience. It shouldn't surprise us that in the concluding pages to Negative Dialectics, to illustrate these resources, Adorno permits himself an appeal to such traces of sensuous experience, though he's clearly speaking to an experience far more expansive than formal aesthetics. Consciousness, he writes, could not despair at all over what is gray if it did not harbor the concept of a different color, whose scattered trace is not lacking in the negative whole. It follows that epistemic negativism can't be a suitable term for making sense of Adorno's views. Recalling the imagery from Beethoven's Fidelio, Adorno would have argued that however much modern society has come to resemble a prison, we know that the prison is not plunged into total darkness, at least some light, however partial and imperfect, still shines into the prison itself. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for uh, an enormously rich talk. Uh, I know there are going to be lots of questions. Let me just start the discussion by offering three or four uh, comments. And I, I've read the paper in advance, so these are not just off the top of my head. Uh, the first has to do with the issue of uh, epistemic negativity, the issue that you described as essentially a Gnostic view uh, of the world as either inherently uh, inherently evil, inherently closed, inherently uh, irredeemable, or having fissures, cracks, uh, normative traces of something better. Seems to me that you're right in arguing against uh, what you attributed to Fabian Freienhagen, but Adorno uh, in any consistent way could not have held that the world was utterly and completely uh, uh, without any sort of uh, uh, interior contradiction or crack or something that allows us to at least have a glimpse of uh, something beyond it. But I think the way to address that is to return to the notion of negation in a Hegelian context, uh, which is very different from the Gnostic notion. And to understand negation uh, the way, say, Marcuse does uh, in the beginning of Reason Revolution, he talks about the power of negative thinking as dynamic, uh, as dialectically intertwined with the positive, as always in some way uh, part of a whole that is yet to be realized, not simply uh, as an either or. So the, to do justice to negativity or negation in the world is to move us away from the Gnostic view to that basically dialectical view. I, I would think uh, in a way the paper would be enriched by bringing out that conflict uh, in two, term, uh, two versions of negativity. Uh, the second major point has to do with uh, the crypto or imminent normative uh, quanta qui that uh, I think you've located in the Dornos. 
it seems to me that what we have, and this is a, in a way, I don't know, it's disturbing, but I think it's very, um, uh, very blatant in the way he uh, rhetorically operates. He gives us a laundry list, you might say, of terms which are uh, hints of or gestures towards uh, an other which is not of the present order. And these include, and I made a, a little list, uh, the true, uh, the right, uh, the real, uh, the free, uh, the good, uh, reconciliation, uh, peace, uh, blind somatic pleasure. Uh, and then of course, happiness broadly understood. And then uh, the most uh, expansive, the more redemption. Now we could spend, you know, I don't know how many millennia trying to make sense of all of these terms. The simple point I would make is that he doesn't, I think, give us a clear enough understanding of how they are all compatible. Uh, how that one wants somatic pleasure at the same time as one wants redemption. Uh, one wants freedom at the same uh, uh, time as one wants uh, truth and so forth. So that all of these are terms which are in play and the assumption of the compatibility is what has to, I think, be challenged. One doesn't really know, even in the, let's call it best of all possible worlds, that we can somehow find total happiness commensurate with all the others. So I think that's a crucial issue that is never satisfactorily uh, addressed. And of course, just to point to the issue of happiness, Kant and other philosophers have been very reluctant to talk about happiness as if it were a uniform phenomenon. The idea of total happiness begs the question really of how we uh, can reconcile happinesses. So is it the happiness of the greatest number or uh, is it a kind of philosophy, reciprocal happiness? In other words, happiness itself is too, you might say, empty a signifier. You know, you know the book by Darren McMahon that, that deals with this. Uh, and this brings up another point concerning what I would call the difficulty of distinguishing between true happiness, true freedom, true versions of all of these normative points, and their what we might call false simulacra, uh, the way in which a pseudo notion of happiness, a pseudo notion of freedom operates. And in the case of Fidelio, it's quite interesting. I went back and looked at Adorno's uh, book on Beethoven, his unfinished book on Beethoven, and he has a few pages on Fidelio. And he says, and let me quote it here, that it has a hieratic cultic quality. In it, the revolution is not depicted, but reenacted as in ritual. It could have been written to celebrate the anniversary of the Bastille. No tension, just the quote, transformation in Leonora's moment in jail, decided in advance. An eccentric stylized simplicity of means. In other words, what we get in, Leonora, in Fidelio is a kind of pseudo happiness, a pseudo revolution. So Adorno was always telling us that we ought not to be satisfied with false versions of da la la la. And that's a crucial issue that needs to be addressed. The final point I want to make, and this is one that I'm in a way most interested in, is the relation between imminent and transcendent. It's a very, I think, suggestive moment in one of Rainer Forrest's recent books, where he says that we have to understand those two terms in terms of the perspective uh, of those of us who are taking the imminent uh, and the transcendent uh, point of view. The perspective of imminence is the perspective of a participant, someone in the middle of the fray, someone inside uh, the beast, someone who does not have the luxury of being uh, a mere observer. The point of view of transcendence is above the fray, is God's eyes, uh, God's eye view, or some sort of view outside of the totality in which we're immersed. Now, this uh, maps on to Adorno's notion, not perfectly, because participation, and this is kind of forced to Hamasian speaking, involves everybody being a participant in the process of life, to quote Habermas. Everybody basically being involved in intersubjective relationships in which no one has the point of view of the single observer. Everybody is always, in some sense, uh, in a kind of collective and subjective communal or whatever you want to call the kind of non-individual uh, uh, point of view. Whereas transcendence basically can be simply singular. And so what Adorno doesn't give us, and I think this is the Habermasian in the speaking, is enough access to the participant aspect of imminence that we are in the middle. 
And then the question really has to be asked, who is in the we, who is excluded from the we, who uh, are strangers, who are friends? In other words, it raises social questions about uh, where the eminent knowledge comes from, rather than the idea that we could simply measure concepts against the realization, which abstracts from the participatory uh, uh, dimension of eminence that I think uh, someone like Ryan, of course, uh, wants to emphasize. But let me stop there. Those are big questions, and I don't know if you want to think about them and address them first, or we should open up the audience to that hope those uh, were at least some ways to sort of pry open uh, some of the uh, issues that the talk raises. Thanks. Th thank you very much. I have I could go on for another hour in answering this, and it's, it's very, very rich comments and very helpful and uh, helpful for me as I uh, revise and expand. But since uh, since people were treated to my voice already for for a full hour, uh, I, I imagine there might be others who are um, chomping at the bit to offer uh, offer responses. I'm 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 the rabbit here. You know, I've just been shot, but I'm going to act dead for a second and then escape. So Peter, uh, uh, maybe Peter, others so far, would like to. Peter, so far uh, there's enough time. Uh, we don't yet have a slew of questions, and I'm just tallying a couple of them. So if you'd like to respond to Marty uh, for starters, and then we'll turn to a couple questions that are just starting to come in. Oh, okay. All right. I won't bolt off like the jackrabbit then. I'll, I'll, I'll at least offer a, a, a beginning of a response, though there's many things I could say. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I, let me point out, by the way, that Ian McDonald is here and joined us, and, and he just waved. Uh, he's written an excellent book on, on, on the, the concept of possibility in Adorno, and, and uh, I think he would have a lot to say about about many of these issues right here. What, what the, 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 if I could just, comp I agree with you, of course, that there's great semantic drift in Adorno whenever he directs our attention to the normative moment, the true, the good, the right, uh, reconciliation, happiness, peace, redemption. That's, this is a very, very good point. I, I, <clears throat> I tend to think that happiness is in, in, in some respects, the 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 locus term around which the others uh, circulate, uh, but we could we could have an argument about which one lies more at the center. And I agree with you. There's drift. The one point I would make um, uh, before hearing from others is that um, the contrast between imminence and transcendence um, is, of course, not a binary contrast and. Um, I would actually insist that Adorno is rather like Habermas in the sense that he wants to speak about imminent transcendence, right? With transcendence from within. And in that respect, he's, he's practicing a fairly standard moment of imminent critique that tarries with ne the negative and finds within the negative uh, a, a source of Here's invoking Ian McDonald's book, real possibility that that overturns aspects of the present that uh, that that need to be overturned, and I think that the you know the charge of performative negativity, the performative contradiction, or the charge of thoroughgoing negativism or epistemic negativism or or what's been called austere negativism, does a disservice to how much Adorno is actually like. Uh, Habermas, or even like Hegel in this respect, in believing, in, in, in fastening his attention on imminent transcendence, right? On transcendence from within, on those moments of our current social and personal experience that furnish glimpses of an alternative way of being. And but you know the, the 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 key point, however, it seems to me that sets him apart from someone like Habermas, and that I think Habermas finds very objectionable in Adorno, is that Adorno doesn't believe that those sources of normativity are available in conceptual form. Adorno instead practices something like a phenomenology of 
imminent transcendence, where he wants to direct our attention to experiences that he can describe. And he describes them in his aesthetic, in his aesthetic writing. He describes them when he describes music, when he says, you know, that there's more hope in the sound of the horse hooves uh, in, in, in Beethoven's slipped my mind, uh, 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 in a particular piano sonata by Beethoven, there's more hope, I think, no, sorry, it's in the Archduke Trio. Uh, there's more ho ho uh, hope in the sound of the horse hooves in the Archduke Trio than there is in all the four gospels. What he's trying to do is direct our attention to that moment of imminent transcendence, and he's showing it to us. Uh, and it's not available in conceptual form for him. He's, he is rather suspicious of concepts. And, you know, one way in which I think Freienhagen is right is to say that Adorno doesn't want to play a traditional philosopher in terms of laying out a set of norms, conceptual standards that we make use of in ethical reasoning in order to condemn this or that feature of the world. I think that's right. But what he does want to do is practice this kind of phenomenological description, showing us what those glimpses of happiness are like, even though those two are precarious or, or disfigured. And I think those uh, are to use very Habermasian language, those are context transcending moments. They, they don't actually transcend the context, but they, ha they have an anticipatory status. They operate as a kind of normative surplus that spills over our current social world and points toward you know, a, a, a different world. There's much, much more I could say, but I, I, I just went on at much greater length than I intended to, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Peter, uh, and thanks, Marty, for the questions. Uh, we may have time to come back again to the back and forth between the two of you. For the moment, we have a question from Benjamin Randolph, Peter, and it goes like this. He says, I'm very sympathetic to your perspective. However, I don't think you've shown that Adorno is not an epistemic negativist. Isn't epistemic negativism equivalent to saying we have no knowledge of what is really true, but only of what is false. Isn't our knowledge of the fractures in the false, including the promesse de bonheur, compatible with epistemic negativism? The actual ground in a bad world of the true, the good, is still the false, the bad. If I'm right, your argument and Freienhagen's ought to be compatible. Beautiful. Well, I hope that's true. Thank you for the comment. I don't actually see the individual who just asked this on my screen, so forgive me. But that's a, it's that's a that's a a, a lovely attempt at reconciliation. Perhaps you're right. Uh, what I was concluding in my response to Marty was something approaching that, in the sense that if we construe Freienhagen's argument in uh, in a in a narrower sense as arguing against the conceptual grasp of the good, qua good, you know, uh, then then it might be possible uh, to to reconcile my position with his. Um, but he he actually goes so far as to say we can't imagine what the good is like, and I don't think that's right. I mean, I think that uh, I think that you know, Dorno's work is thick with imaginative gestures, um, and again, they're not primarily conceptual. In his lectures on moral philosophy, he lays out a number of reasons why he doesn't trust ethical reasoning at all. Um, uh, and yet there's this different mode of fastening upon normative resources, uh, the, the normative sur surplus uh, that spills over what's false in our world. Um, so construed, construed more narrowly, my argument wouldn't be uh, incompatible with with Freienhagen's. Peter, our next one is from Ian McDonald, and it reads as follows: Fragments of happiness certainly exist in this world. In Kultur and Culture, Adorno says that even an ice cream cone is a fragment of utopia and represents its fulfillment but such fragments are just that, fragments. Ice cream cones are not yet redemption. They are not sufficient as such 
and qua fragments stand also as proof of the wrongness of the way life and society are currently organized. For this reason, fleeting sensuous experience as a quote refuge cannot be held up as an ideal of any kind. These moments are mere placeholders for right life. Among other things, doesn't the fleeting happiness of sensuous experience demand of us a theory of society that redeems what these experiences represent, i.e. redemption, and explains their current fragmentariness? Otherwise, the prison cell will remain a prison cell and we will be left only with the rays of light that happen to fall upon us. What concept, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, whoops. What concept, uh, forgive me, the cursor uh, is not behaving. What concept of society might do justice to these fragments and to that which they represent? Ian, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely certain we're in disagreement here. I mean, what Adorno says is every, every individual happiness is a fragment of the total happiness uh, that the world denies. That's the phrase. And uh, maybe I have it slightly garbled there, but um, I think it's fairly clear for Adorno that he, that he can only um, legitimately refer to something as a fragment if he thinks of it as a fragment of a whole, which is to say he thinks of these momentary experiences as glimpses of what the total social situation would be. Now, does he have a kind of map of or a blueprint of what society would be like such that all of those fragments could then be assembled into a social world? Clearly not. And you know, it's I think it's one of um, uh, it's one of the glaring deficits of Adorno as a philosopher that he doesn't have a well-developed uh, political theory. Uh, he really doesn't. Uh, instead, what you get is this kind of gesture, this, this, this gesture condemning present society, but then insisting that there are moments within it that could somehow be assembled into the whole. And assembling in them into the whole would transform even the experiences. And here's, that was your point, it seems to me. Uh, and this is the point I came to at the end, that even those particular moments don't serve as self-contained uh, utopias because even those self-contained moments uh, exhibit great damage. The, the disfigurements of, their, of the surrounding social world are evident in those experiences. Uh, so, so maybe we're not so far apart on this point. I just want to say that the that Adorno clearly thinks that the notion of fragment is already a kind of let's see, it's kind of a logical anticipation of the total social order we don't yet have. Does that make sense? You're you're muted. <laughs> I, oh, I can unmute myself. That's uh, yeah. that's novel. Hi, <laughs> hi, Peter. Um, <laughs> it's the it's the total social uh, total aspect that you just mentioned that that worries me. I mean, you know the the 1942 theses on need. There's a seminar that Adorno and Horkheimer ran uh, in Hollywood. Um, one of the things that they argued against was this idea that uh, a pint of milk for everybody would be each day would be a good would be a good idea um, and a progressive social policy. And it strikes me that um, it's a bit like saying everybody should get an ice cream cone every day. Uh, and one of the things that they uh, what, that they say is that this is just a continuation of the wrong life. So if the ice cream cone 
you know, to put it sort of summarily, if the ice cream cone is a fragment of happiness, and uh, ice cream cones for everyone is not a solution, um, then what's the what's the the horizon? What concept of society? That was really my question. What concept of society is awaiting us on the horizon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my only thought here is to say once again that I think that Adorno is a very bad political philosopher, right? He doesn't know what the um, what the and what what the anticipatory bridge looks like. How do we get from these moments to the social whole that would instantiate them and assemble them? Uh, I don't think he knows how to do that. Of course, many people would say Marx didn't know how to do that either. I mean, his ban on utopianism was 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 evidence of that. Um, the well, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I I I think he's very bad at at telling you what that bridge looks like, but I think he insists that there is that bridge, and I think he wants to insist that our current social reality gives us the materials we need to at least point beyond it. And that may seem minimalist, but that minimalist thought, I think, is enough to redeem him from the charge of being uh, a totalizing negativist, which I, I think is just wrong. I think it's a, basically a philosophical construct that creates a problem for us that we don't actually have when we read Adorno, right? So. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Peter, <clears throat> this next question is from Pardis Dabashi. And I also want to say to everyone that we're very fortunate that tomorrow uh, in the discussion with Peter, we'll be having a full response uh, from Pardis. Um, and it'll be a wonderful opportunity to hear her thinking in action in a more sustained, uh, at a more sustained length. This is the question that Pardis is asking right now, Peter. Could you talk a bit about the role of hyperbole in Adorno, the moments, a couple of which you cite in your talk, where he seems to lash out in his prose and say things that make that makes him available to charges of epistemic negativism. Are these simply stylistic ticks? Do you think he wants us to take them seriously, to work through them, so to speak? Or are we to set aside as simply momentary are we to set them aside as simply momentary outcroppings of a frustration he then proceeds to temper? What a great question. I've been thinking about this a great deal and I only gesture toward it in my talk rather dismissively because I'm so impatient with that, with the, the, that stylistic quirk. I mean, I know there are a great many readers of Adorno who find that the most seductive feature of his writing. They'd, they'd love the, you know, the most expansive uh, negative statements, you know, they love Adorno in high dungeon, right? And I, I, I don't. I mean, this is this is the Nietzschean moment in Adorno that that I I find actually quite distasteful. I mean, it's stylistically, I suppose, it's rather interesting. It's it's sometimes rather darkly exhilarating to people, but but the, the philosopher in me is is deeply. Uh, uh, troubled and frustrated by those moments, and I want him to actually say what he means, rather than offer us um, this extravagant, you know, uh, uh, high octane version of it that actually doesn't capture the careful thought. Um, having said that, I grant that this means uh, reading suspiciously a great many versions of totalizing skepticism or austere negativism that would support Fabian's book and, and other literature in the field. And, and, and my reading, which I think is one of interpretive charity, redeems Adorno perhaps too, too easily from, from, from that charge by simply saying, well, this is clearly, this is clearly an exaggeration, <laughs> right? Um, there, now, there's another way out of this, um, and um, 
another friend suggested this to me. Um, he said, what if Adorno is just not consistent? I mean, what if we basically say Adorno is making two different kinds of claims that he himself doesn't try to reconcile, but he seems fully committed to both of them. And they actually give us self-consistent but mutually exclusive images of society. This is basically Adorno's antinomy, <laughs> right? And I, and I think I think one could read him that way. One could say the world is one without freedom. Reason has degraded into pure instrumentality. Uh, um, uh, you know, all promises of, of freedom, uh, all promises of happiness are regressive. Uh, all bids to uh, um, uh, all bids to truth are part of the jargon of authenticity and so on and so forth, right? You can give a kind of self-consistent portrait of Adorno where he looks like that. One half of Kant's third antinomy, there ain't no freedom. The other half, you get the kind of thing I'm describing, right? And maybe that's what you want to do. You just want to say Adorno was stuck in an antinomy and he was caught between these two positions. I, I don't like that. And so I'm left... I'm left invoking the idea of interpretive charity and trying to say that much of the Nietzschean stuff is just overkill and it's just hyperbole. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm unlike you, I'm not a sensitive literary scholar, so I don't know what to do with the thought of his um, hyperbole. I mean, he, he's a, he's a master stylist and he, he, he's in command of that hyperbole, I imagine, and has some intent behind it. Um, but you know, you could, you could offer a great deal of instruction for me, uh, in thinking about why he does that. Can I just unmute myself for a second and, <laughs> and say that, and thanks so much for this response, Peter. I'll just, I'll just quickly say, and then I'll, and then I'll, you know, um, leave it to others. I, I think I read those moments of not being in control. Actually, I read those moments of because uh, I like I like you, I find myself frustrated with those moments as well, because I think to myself, well, that's not really what you mean. Um, and and I and for me, it's and I hear him. I almost hear him speaking in those moments. I hear him in like active uh, dialogue almost in those moments and frustrated. And so he reaches for the more sweeping claim the way one would if talking to some somebody like over coffee or something. Um, there's something, do you, do you know what I mean? So um, I, I don't actually read them as intentional. I read them as slightly, um, I, I don't wanna say sloppy, but um, yeah, I don't know, I'll stop there. I'll think more about what I, what I mean. Well, but, I, I, I'm tempted to say that he's trying to capture a pretty good intuition that we have about the difficulty of sustaining any proper ethical practice in the midst of social structures that are compromising. And this, 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 this relates directly to what, to, to Ian's question a moment ago. Um, you know, the, the, the phrase, there's, there's no right living in the false, could be understood as a very compressed way of saying that under conditions that involve, for example, a great deal of, of socioeconomic exploitation, the bourgeois life itself is implicated no matter how much it tries to practice abstention and purity and so forth. You know, recycle, sure, you're gonna engage in recycling, but the, you know, you know, an entire apparatus of society is set up to make that uh, to make your own private gestures of recycling, nothing more than a kind of compensatory uh, 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 gesture compromised entirely by everything that's enabling you or me to, you know, stay in my house uh, while, you know, the, um, the essential workers are doing the, the, the dirty business that makes society run. So there is no right li living in the false is operating on two levels, the level of individual or personal experience and the level of social structure. And in that sense, the phrase can be dismantled 
it no longer looks like a hyperbolic statement. It looks like the compression of a statement that uh, fits together that antinomy. Yeah. And then, you know, and, 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 and speaks to those two levels and the sense that we have of being always compromised. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know if that satisfies Ian either, but. Um... <laughs> Peter, our next question is from Gurikba Singh Sahota, who says, very illuminating lecture. I very much like how you make us have to think of Adorno as a qualified, even realistic utopian. I'm wondering if you could comment on the specific moments in which the notion of utopia crops up explicitly in Adorno's writings. For instance, the line from Negative Dialectics that goes, quote, utopia would be the non-identity of the subject without sacrifice. How is utopia related to sacrifice in his work? Does utopia emerge in the mode of non-identity, for example, against the logics of reification? I'm most interested in the relation or lack thereof to sacrifice. Thank you. That's a that's a very very rich question, and I I mean I, we could add utopia to the um, laundry list of of normatively promising terms that 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 uh, Martin Jay described at the beginning. Um, I happen to find utopia one of the least satisfying and most dangerous of such terms because it's it's so supercharged, right? Like like redemption, by the way, which some people read literally turning Adorno into a kind of theologian uh, despite himself, uh, which I, I, I prefer not to do. And utopia, of course, is a term that comes loaded with a great deal of, uh, of disapproval given the Marxian heritage and the ban on utopian thinking. Um, uh, and yet Adorno does use it sometimes uh, interchangeably with terms like uh, redemption or uh, uh, reconciliation. Um, if I can, if I can go back to the, um, if I, I'll, I'll go back here and, uh, oh dear, how do we do this? I want to go back to that passage from, um, uh, negative dialectics, uh, that if I, if I'm recalling it correctly, it uses the word utopia. Um, I'll get there. There we go. Was utopia in there? Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. After the, it would have been better with some kind of word search. Um, yeah, the moment of truth of ideology. Okay. Peter, uh, we've been exhausting you. And I think that yeah. given our idea of ending at about seven, we're going to take one more. I would like okay. to encourage everyone. There's a number of other questions. If you send them to me, uh, Robert Kaufman, uh, at the Critical Theory Program, I will send them to Peter. And if he has any time, uh, hopefully he'll try and respond. I, I can't promise. But at least that will be a way, because uh, the, the questions that are in the queue all look wonderful. The next one, and I, I want to take them in order, is from Alexander Lin. And uh, this is someone who clearly by the question has read uh, Peter's wonderful book that Marty held up at the start, um, Migrants in the Profane, Critical Theory and the Question of Secularization. Uh, this is Alexander's question. Thank you for a wonderful talk, Professor Gordon. I would like to ask you to elaborate on the relation of the normative surplus central to Adorno's imminent critique to the normative deficit you identify in the book uh, it just came out on Weber, Schmidt, and Benjamin uh, in Migrants in the Profane. If I am right in sensing the problematic legacy of the secularization thesis lurking behind uh, the totalizing thesis of epistemic negativism, as you've described it here, how would you relate this to the problems of neo-Gnosticism and the secular religious divide? Thanks. Very rich question. Thank you for, for 
for linking this up to, to, to my last book. I, I appreciate that a great deal. Um, and I'll, I'll be quite frank, I hadn't thought of, of this talk as, as continuing that, that, that argument, but I guess you're right. Um, so, so the point, of, point about a normative deficit was, uh, uh, was really something that I identified in Max Weber's work where he, he uh, burdens religion, particularly religious tradition with all of this normative plenitude and then sees the stripping away of religion as leaving modern society with a particular predicament or what he calls the Zinproblem, the problem of meaning, which all of us are afflicted with as moderns uh, uh, once uh, uh, the disenchantment of the world and rationalization have run their course. And that problem of a normative deficit, I claim, is something that remains alive for uh, thinkers like Benjamin uh, uh, via Schmidt in some ways, and also in Horkheimer. And the, the burden of my book was to say that Adorno seems to be the only one who um, offers a possible way out uh, without uh, returning to religion the way Benjamin does in certain moments and the way Horkheimer clearly does by the end of his life. And I think Adorno doesn't make that concession. And the, the challenge of my book was to try to explain how it is that Adorno escapes the theory of normative deficit and how he escapes a kind of concession to religion that returns us to the Weberian, uh, the Weberian thesis of religious plenitude. Um, I'll, I'll have more to say about this point tomorrow and, and this will maybe uh, be a good place to round out today's discussion because negative dialectics concludes with meditations on metaphysics, which is Adorno's attempt to respond to the question, what remains of metaphysics in a secularizing world? Uh, what possible resources can we appeal to that have the function that metaphysics used to have, even though in a secularizing world, we can no longer identify uh, uh, metaphysics uh, as, um, as uh, in, in the full sense, uh, for example, in the sense of a, a super sensible world or a world of, of uh, 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 populated by divinities and so forth. And, and that's what meditations on metaphysics is meant to address and, and you know, where Adorno uh, turns at the end is to this very strange concept of metaphysical experience, which bears a close resemblance to what I was discussing today in terms of fragments of happiness or moments of happiness. So I think that's that's uh, probably a good setup for tomorrow. Peter, thank, thank you. you so much. And Marty, thank you so much for both the introduction and the response. And we'd like to invite everyone uh, to come back tomorrow at 5 p.m. California time in the afternoon. And uh, as Dan had indicated at the start, uh, just to remind people that the readings for tomorrow uh, from Negative Dialectics are on our Critical Theory Program website. Again, Peter, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the work and all the patience thank and you the all energy. For your questions. And thanks. thanks so much to everyone who asked questions and to the entire audience. And everyone, um, just take care. See you all tomorrow.